I think that's what makes it such a great holiday. It really is a holiday for family and family mm-hmm. in a particular kind of fun way. That's what the holiday day is. And so right. it's about bringing family together. Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Dixon. And on behalf of Camp for Progress, I have the privilege and esteemed honor uh, to welcome you to this conversation featuring our guest. Without further ado, please welcome Harvard University's Carl M. Loeb Professor of History, Pulitzer Prize recipient, uh, widely celebrated for her expansive work detailing and shifting scholarship on President Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, and her children, author of the timely part historical part memoir on Juneteenth, and friend of the Ham fam, Professor <laughs> Annette Gordon-Reed, um, this is going to come out on June t- Juneteenth, so I want to say happy Juneteenth to you. Thank you thank for your you, time. Thank you. Welcome. Same to you, too. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thank you for giving us your time. We really appreciate it. And um, I'm excited to uh, educate people about this, um, this holiday that you wrote about um, and tell people a little bit, about, uh, get people informed about your story a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, I want to open with... Um, discussing your most recent work. I know that you worked on it through uh, throughout the pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, which I find um, extremely motivational and insp- inspiring because uh, personally, inspiration has waxed <laughs> and waned uh, throughout the, la- <laughs> the last 20 years. Uh, motivation has been, been um, easy to come by on some days and hard on others. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but this book was so timely and, and for so many reasons. And um, it almost felt like divine intervention uh, <laughs> to me, I think, a little bit. Um, I, I want to know um, briefly uh, the history of Juneteenth and how the idea for this book came to you. Okay, well, Juneteenth is the actual holiday, is mm-hmm. uh, a way of commemorating June 19th, 1865, when U.S. Army General Gordon Granger came to Galveston, Texas, and announced that slavery was over in Texas. He was able to do this because the Confederate army had kept fighting after Lee surrendered in Appomattox in April. Two months later, they were still fighting and they finally surrendered at the beginning of June. And so then he takes his troops into Texas and makes this announcement. And also it's in something called general order number three, says that slavery is over. And he also says that enslaved people, former enslaved people would then be occupy a place of uh, absolute equality with their former enslavers, which obviously made them very happy, but certainly made uh, whites, many whites in the area unhappy. So it was a time of great joy and hope for the former enslaved, but it was also a time for expressing a lot of hostility. A lot of violence was unleashed against them in retaliation for all of this. And so We've celebrated this holiday. Um, The first one was the next Juneteenth, uh, 1866, and it's been celebrated ever since then. Uh, I decided to write this book, as you said, in the pandemic, because I had written a piece for The New Yorker about the holiday Juneteenth, and then I had written um, a book review of about five books about Texas for the New York Review of Books the year before. And so Texas was on my mind. I grew up in Texas and I've always wanted to write about it. And I thought about my parents who are no longer living. I thought about what would they make of this situation? And so thinking about them, thinking about Texas made me decide that I wanted to write this book. And so I spent a good part of June, well, I think I started in July, June and July and um, wrote it um, basically over the summer. And I, I just find it so in- interesting that your your DNA uh, exists throughout the the history of this holiday, like your personal DNA, your personal touch that you put on the story. Mm-hmm. Um, what what impact do you hope that the book has? And um, so far, what is your what are you most proud of um, that well, you've seen? Well, I think it's I think that's a good way of putting it. You put it exactly right. I mean, my f- mother's family has been in Texas. I could trace it back to the 1820s before Texas is Texas is still part of Mexico. Uh, My father's family, at least the 1860s, maybe even before then. So and most of my family has always been in Texas. I mean, some people have families all over the all over the state. But I'm mainly my when my 
uh, family pretty much stayed in Texas. When they left the little towns that they were in, they went to Houston, and they went to Dallas. They mm. didn't go other places. I, I was weird in going off uh, <laughs> to, to college and then getting married and staying here, um, staying in the North. Um, so I, I think the impact that I wanna have is I want people to think about themselves as a part of history. Because you could tell the story of your family through your family history, through the history of, of America, the various things that are happening. That's what I wanted to achieve to make people think about the way history shapes us uh, all the time. And I wanted people to think about Texas in a different kind of way. Um, I say in the book, Texas is, has been constructed as a white man. You think of you know, Texans, you think of the, the cowboy and even though cowboys, were black. Many of the cowboys were black. <laughs> Hollywood has created an image of them as white guys or cattle ranchers or the oil man, the rich person. in the. Oil. These are all white guys. And I want people to think about Texans, Texas from the perspective of a black woman. You know, I'm as much a Texan as any Texas oil man or whatever. And what has the state meant to people like me? And Latino people, what is it, what is it meant to women? So yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to, to achieve with all of this. And I wanted to think about Texas in, a, Texas in a different way. And I want people to think about themselves as figures in history. It's not just famous people, ordinary people. We all have a history and the history has shaped our family lives. It's so interesting. Um, I, even as a young kid, um, I was like five, six, seven, um, when I started uh, starting to question my identity as a, as a Black man and as an American, um, mm -hmm. and how do I, I, I'm sure I wouldn't have put it as uh, eloquently at that age, but it was always in my mind that I was Black and my Americanness was separate. Mm -hmm. um, those are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I found myself... Uh, you know, neglecting Black holidays as a kid and in, 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 um, in, uh, in, in opposition to just being labeled as Black and mm -hmm. then trying to celebrate July 4th mm -hmm. um, because I was patriotic. Mm -hmm. um, and then I shifted the complete opposite direction <laughs> at some point and I was only doing Black holidays and I mm -hmm. wasn't American. And mm -hmm. um, so I find it really interesting that you know, th throughout throughout my life, um, my experience has been just the same. And um, I really find it really um, key that your 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 work makes plain that American history is just that. And American history doesn't belong to one sect or category of people that belongs to all Americans. And mm -hmm. um, no matter when you got here, no matter when your ancestors got here, you know, mm -hmm. if you got here yesterday and 100 years prior. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate that. And um, with that in mind, what do you what do you feel is the value of celebrating Juneteenth nationally? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the end of chattel slavery was a emancipation was a process. There's emancipation proclamation. There's enslaved people themselves emancipating themselves by running away uh, and uh, black men who ran away and joined the army. And there are these different points in which they're it, it sort of working towards the abolition or the end of the institution of legalized slavery. It's important to note that that's an important event in Texas history and United States history. It's an important event, I think, in world history of, of human rights in general, mm -hmm. the end of the idea that people should be treated as things and bought and sold and separated from their family and used as instruments of other, the other people. So anytime that happens and any way it happens, we should take note of it. And we should mm -hmm. pay attention to that because it, give, it offers us a way of looking at the world around us to look for things that we might change now. Right. Things that are certainly in some instances legacies of all of that. So I think it's important, you know, we we can fixate on disasters. You can fixate on bad things that happen. I think that we should, when, we, when human beings do something right, do the right yes. thing, we should take note of that. And right. we should also take note of, I mean, for me, is remembering people who suffered a lot under the institution of slavery. Right. And even though they knew 
you know, this wasn't going to make everything okay immediately. They were hopeful. And I think taking note of that hope is also important. Right. It, out of respect for them, you can't do, you know, you, you know, you can't give them back the days that they lived under slavery, but you can have respect and pay respect towards their joy and their sense of hope when they learn that slavery, legalized slavery was over. Right. I, I, I think it's, it's almost like um, America kind of takes leaps and bounds um, every so, ever so often to um, become more America. Mm-hmm. To become to become yeah. more mm-hmm. more in line with what it says it is as a you know and um, change its practices to be more in line with what America says it, it is mm-hmm. and so commemorating days like Juneteenth um, feels like something we should do and uh, and commemorating days of of successes um, mm-hmm. uh, of of America is is um, is very important and I think it it says a lot to. Um, future generations that will be celebrating this years and years from now. Um, mm-hmm. It just says that these are the things that we hold uh, true to our values. So um, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, on a more personal level, how is it celebrated in Texas? I, I know that um, in college, uh, it kind of was a day when all the Black people got together in the calf <laughs> and um, cracked a couple jokes and that was about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm curious for a community that's been celebrating mm-hmm. um, this holiday for so long, what, what it was like. Well, when I was a kid uh, celebrating it, it was a day to uh, drink red soda water, which is <laughs> pop, you know, I mean, you know, strawberry soda water or big red, which I don't know what it's made of, but big red is soda water. Uh, and I, I read somewhere that hibiscus tea, which is red drink, was probably the first thing that people back in the 19th century when they didn't have red soda water, but it was a day of doing that and eating barbecue. Did they they tell you, did they tell you like it was for the blood that was sacrificed or something like that? No, someone I've I've heard that recently, but that's not what they said. That's not, I mean, it's just, (laughs) it's either, you know, because of that or because black people like red. I I don't know (laughs) know what, what it is, but so it was the red drink, uh, barbecue. Uh, some people barbecued goat. Goat is associated with it. I actually saw a goat killed one time for this wow. purposes. I watched that once and not again. <laughs> uh, my family, we didn't have goat, but barbecue and um, firecrackers. I, we were, I can't believe this, but you know, below the age of 10, we were allowed to play with firecrackers. <laughs> you know, we had matches and throw, you know, playing war and with firecrackers. Uh, and you know, my grandmother got a recipe from my mother who got a recipe from another woman for tamales. And my grandmother used to make tamales to sell because she was raising money for the St. Luke's United Methodist church to build a new church. Mm. And so she would take orders for tamales on holidays. And so we made tamales uh, which is a very Texas thing. I mean, sort of a, it sort of shows you the kind of multicultural nature, nature of Texas. We had what you would call, you know, typical Southern fare, soul food, but we also had tamales. We're making tamales uh, for, for Juneteenth as well. So that's what we did. It was, a, it was a family day. People came over and, you know, people played dominoes. The old men played dominoes and, uh, you know, in the gender conformity of the time, the women cooked <laughs> and prepared food and did things. And uh, the kids just ran around and went crazy drinking too much soda. Cause we, I mean, in our day, we really didn't, soda was not a, a com. I mean, that was sort of a treat once in the time, you know, right. <laughs> once the time it was not, but here, you know, there would be buckets of ice full of, you know, with bottles of soda and stuff in, in it. And it was just a day of excess <laughs> uh, for us. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, as I got to be older, I understood what it was about more. Uh, my great grandmother lived uh, until I was about 11. And I can remember talking to her about, you know, what it meant to her and to what it meant to her mother. Her mother had been born enslaved, was freed mm-hmm. as a girl, along with her mother by her, by her father, who actually who owned her, was the legal owner of her. So my great grandmother knew somebody intimately who had been for a time in slavery and 
uh, she, um, her mother had also growing up had married a man who um, she had a couple of husbands who died. And then she married a man who uh, was enslaved until the end of slavery. So my grandmother mm. knew him, my great grandmother knew him as a stepfather. So this was really, really close to her and close to me too. I mean, I yeah. knew somebody who knew people who were slaves, you know? And so if people think of this as something that was long ago, it really was not long ago. It's just in the yeah. blink, in terms of history, it's a blink of the eye. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the American timeline is, is so much uh, shorter and younger than people uh, tend to think. And sometimes when you, when you put it into context of the people you know and the stories you know, Mm -hmm. um, it makes so much more sense. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, is because one of, one of my fears is that Juneteenth, along with many other Black celebrations and holidays and cultural celebrations and holidays, will become capitalized and commercialized. And um, they'll, that they lose, sometimes these holidays tend to lose the depth and recognition of the reason we're celebrating. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that is Juneteenth ours or is it in tandem with a holiday like July 4th? It is, in, is it in conversation with July 4th? Is the American way of celebrating mm -hmm. Independence Day um, appropriate for Juneteenth? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a fear. Other people have expressed that fear that when people, anytime, you know, large number of people latch on to things, uh, I mean, you, you fear the commodification of it. That's going to happen to some degree because this is the United States of America <laughs> and eventually everything <laughs> becomes commercialized. That's what yeah. we do. But I don't think that you should, I, I think, and I, I was concerned about that too, but I, I've come to the conclusion that what you have to do is just ride herd on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people who are serious about the holiday have to keep the meaning of it in you know, the foreground. And all of these corporations and organizations that are celebrating it now um, are many of them, and we should insist on this, hope for this, having sort of educational things that are part of it. Um, that's relatively, I think it's relatively easy to do. Um, there's going to be a danger of it, but I think we just have to, we have to, um, uh, as I said, have to be serious about staking a claim about the importance of this and making sure that people know it. I don't want it not to become celebrated in the country and maybe in the world because we fear the commodification of it. Mm -hmm. We have to work against that. I think the, the benefits of that will outweigh the burden of that possibility. And I think, as I said, there are effective ways to do it. All of, a lot of the things that I've seen now, um, some of the organizations that are celebrating it have you know, educational things around it. And that's all to the good. The more people who know about it, I think the more, you have to be optimistic about it. The more people who know about it, the more good can come from it. The more right. people, minds might be changed. You think about young people who grow up celebrating this. We're thinking about us, or not, you're way younger than I am, but I mean, even young children, if they grow up with this, who knows what kind of attitudes it might change, might things, attitudes that they might reject, you know, attitudes in which, you know, Blacks are supposed to be second-class citizens or whatever, or don't feel empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we should do this take the risk of it for what it might, the story it might communicate to kids who right. grow up with this and think it's like when the president, you know, Barack Obama's president, uh, you know, we viewed it one way, but think about kids who only knew him as, you know, this is what they, <laughs> they came up, came of age with him or, or people who came of age with him knowing that he could be president. Very different right. from me growing up thinking, is this even possible? Right. So I, I think things like this have a way, will have a way of shaping the culture. We can't predict it, but that's history. You know, I mean, you, we can't, I'm, we look back, I'm a historian, I can't tell you what's going to happen, but you have to be, have to be courageous mm -hmm. and, and step out and hope 
for the best and work yeah. to make sure, you know, if, if you see this stuff happening or in your own life or whatever, we can you stand up and say, no, 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 uh, this is not just about um, getting sheets cheaper <laughs> for a white cell, whatever. <laughs> this is this is about commemorating a very serious thing that happened. There was joy in it. Uh, there was reality, pragmatism, understanding that they had a lot to do, but we should try to tap into that and hope for a better future. Yeah, the, the cultural exposure um, of, of holidays is just as important as the celebration. So yeah, exactly. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've been like educated about something about a holiday like Cinco de Mayo. I, I mm-hmm. get a new fact every year that, or, yes. or um, Dia de los Muertes or, you know, mm-hmm. um, I, I just learned something Muslim new every year. holidays that I knew nothing about. You know, right, right. So knew <laughs> right. nothing at all about. And uh, you look at things differently. I mean, it's right. because you say, is that like this celebration that we have? Is it like right. that? You know, it's all useful. Right. You know, in, in my in my dreams, um, Juneteenth is a televised parade mm-hmm. and celebration of the entire diaspora mm-hmm. um, that that fully puts on display the connectivity of our people and our community and just how intersectional and connected our stories and lives and talents and cultures are. Mm-hmm. Um, when I think of it, it feels like, it feels like the black family reunion yeah. um, or yeah. like opening weekend of black Panther. Yeah. Um, I want to know, <laughs> right? I want to, I want to know um, why, why is that idea that the, the the black why is the the black family reunion um such an important institution mm-hmm. well uh i think i've speculated that it has to do with slavery mm-hmm. um because people were treated like property and were sold away from their wives and husbands and children they were given as gifts as wedding presents they were you know moved around at the whim of other people and at the end of slavery they traveled far and wide to try to piece together and find their relatives. It's right. all been about trying to bring everybody together. And I don't wonder if the kind of, you know, desire to have these family reunions. So many people have told me uh, over the past couple of weeks that not even people who are in Texas, <laughs> people who celebrated Juneteenth, that their families plan their reunions around them. You know, mm-hmm. that this was a time for people to come together. And that's what I think that's what makes it such a great holiday. It really is a holiday for family and family mm-hmm. in a particular kind of fun way. Not right. I mean, Christmas is a holiday for family as well, but it's the winter time <laughs> and <laughs> it's the family typically in the house. And food is important and all of this. But Juneteenth is the sun is shining by June, um, you know. Every state in the union has good weather right. <laughs> by then. And people are outside and they're barbecuing and there's music. Frankie Beverly's playing. I'm, I'm showing my age here. Oh, and, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a Frankie Beverly and Mays fan. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy feelings. I mean, you know, that's before I let you go, all those things. Um, that's what the holiday day is. And so right. it's about bringing family together. And so it, it is a family reunion. That's, that's a perfect. Uh, a perfect expression of what is supposed to be going on there. And that's why it's so important. And having been people who lived in fear of separation from your family, that was the worst thing. The whipping was bad, working for no pay, all that. But the loss of your mother, your children, your right. sisters and brothers was traumatic. Mm. I, uh, we're, we're coming down to our, our last uh, few minutes. And i um, I, I just want to take this a second to say thank you. Um, I, I really admire your ability to hold tension and complexity in your life and your work. Um, it's been very inspiring for me. Um, and I, I've, it's, it's a skill that I'm learning to, um, to take on in my life as well, um, to be able to reconcile um, all sides of the complexities of my existence as a Black, Amer- uh, Black American man. Um, and I know you worked uh, tirelessly to um, to study a much controversial figure in Thomas Jefferson and his complex um, involvement in Sally Hemings' life and um, brought both questions and truth 
to the way we examine Americans' um, often one-sided story. And um, that tension and complexity is uh, very much a part of all of your work. And so I, I really appreciate that. I just want to say thank you for, uh, for being a beacon of truth and honesty um, in the American story. And so with that, I want to ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do the thing that I'm sure plenty, um, uh, plenty interviewers do. And I'm going to ask the historian to look forward. A hundred <laughs> year, years from now, when America looks back on the turn of the 21st century, the 20s, um, <laughs> rebounding from Trump, the pandemic, social unrest, demands for uh, justice reform, a more inclusive and representative American government, and so many other pressing issues, how do you believe the story will be told, and what do you hope they see as your contribution? Well, you say rebound. Uh, I am hopeful that we will rebound from mm -hmm. all of this. I think, well, they will look back and say that this was, hopefully, it was a close call. Mm. You know, we, might, we almost lost it. But <laughs> I'm hopeful they will say we rallied and we heeded the advice of people, particularly African-Americans who really have been from the very beginning trying to uphold the values that you talked about before, about making America, America. We've always been out there saying this and being the, the, the chorus saying, pay, pay attention to this. And I think that mm -hmm. they will look to black people's contribution to that. Uh, the insistence on say Juneteenth studying, as I said before, advances in human rights and recognizing those kinds of things. You know, I hope if they look at, pay attention to anything that I've written, um, I hope that I have contributed to that, that I have said that made the case that you can criticize America, criticize something that you love, and you do it because you do. You mm -hmm. want it to be better, better, and you want it to grow in the right way. So I, I hope they will see me as having contributed to making a more perfect union by talking about the truth of our past, which we have to have before we can go forward. Mm. Yeah, I often, I often say that um, criticism deserves an, another step. Um, it can't be the end. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate that um, your work opens doors beyond criticism and it opens an opportunity for people to rethink um, the complexities of just human existence in general. Mm -hmm. um, none of us is perfect. And um, none, of, none of what has occurred in our entire existence has been perfect, but it's all been for purpose. Um, and, and your work is certainly for purpose. So um, I thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate uh, my, myself personally being able to, to um, have this conversation with you. And um, thank you for your time. And if you're watching from the Hand for Progress page, continue to check out more conversations like this. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me.